For those of you joining us at a TELOS event for the first time, my name is Sarah. I'm a program coordinator at TELOS. And if you're newer to TELOS, we're an organization based in DC that's working to build a world in which all can flourish by unleashing our power to confront injustice. When it comes to Israel-Palestine, we're working for a time when America and most countries around the world sustain the mutual flourishing of all Israelis and Palestinians. Tonight, you've joined us for what's going to be a great conversation about a book, The Wall Between, What Jews and Palestinians Don't Want to Know About Each Other, with special guests and our, our good friends and my good friends at TELOS, Jeff and Raja. For those of you who had hoped to join us live in October, uh, we had to cancel the in-person event. Jeff and Raja had a flight delay. So I'm super grateful we are all together on Zoom. Jeff and Raja are here, and we get to dive into this conversation with them tonight. Raja, to introduce them first, Raja is the CEO of Query Conversations, a human rights and inclusion consultant, the founding president of the Canadian Arab Institute, a board member at Project Rosanna in Canada, and a former 10-year commissioner with the Ontario Human Rights Commission. He's a Canadian committee member of Human Rights Watch and a co-founder of the Canadian Arab Jewish Leadership Dialogue Group. Jeff is an American Jew who lives in Canada. He holds a doctorate in education from the University of Toronto and works actively in the Jewish community and beyond on issues relating to trauma and the Israel-Palestine struggle. Jeff's partnership with Raja was born out of deep listening and learning together and has become central to his work. Jeff and Raja, welcome. So grateful to have you two here sharing about your story, your work, your book. Um, it's going to be a great conversation. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Sarah. Thanks for hosting us. So a little bit about the format tonight. We have 90 minutes together. Um, I'm going to get us started with a couple of questions for Jeff and Raja, but my hope is that you all will also have some questions. If you've had a chance to read at least some of the book, hopefully it sparked your thinking, and this is a great chance to ask Jeff and Raja directly about what they've written or, or any follow-up questions. And if you haven't read the book yet, this is a great chance to ask them questions that they can give you some insight into what the book is about, and you can purchase it and read it later. So why did Telos want to bring the book, The Wall Between and Jeff and Raja to you all into our community? The book is a book about a wall that exists between Jewish and Palestinian communities in the diaspora. And for many folks at Telos in our network, we aren't Jewish or Palestinian, but we care deeply about these issues. And so it's going to be really central for us to understand the narratives that Jeff and Raja unpack as well. And I'm hoping Jeff and Raja can speak to that a little bit more later. But Jeff and Raja, just to get us started, how did you two come to write this really unique book together as people who come from very different backgrounds and seemingly wouldn't collaborate on a project like this? Go ahead, Jeff. Oh, I get to go first. <laughs> Thanks, buddy. Um, well, I mean, uh, my route primarily to this conversation was, I, you know, a long time in human rights work you know, in thinking about how we include or disinclude certain stories. And maybe about 10, 12 years ago during my graduate work, um, I really discovered that I didn't really know much about the Palestinian story. I knew that it existed. I knew that it was a social justice concern. But as a Jew, I'd been relatively protected from it. Um, I knew my story well. I knew stories of the Holocaust and my family's stories well. But I really realized that I, I didn't really know a lot about it. And, you know, and I felt just kind of a basic, a normalized Jewish um, experience that um, Israel was important to me as a Jew and was important for my safety. Um, and I didn't really know about uh, the people on the other side of the wall. And um, through my doctoral work, I interviewed Jews and Palestinians um, and had them um, hear and respond to each other's uh, um, uh, stories through trauma and memory. And Raja was one of my uh, participants uh, slash victims. And um, after it was done, I, I just needed to learn more. I needed to understand more. And I felt that he had a unique uh, way of expressing and um, his own story and listening to the Jewish story. Um, and we began a five, well, probably five year and a bit a collaboration of listening and learning together. Over to you, buddy. For the record, I remain his victim. It wasn't a one-time thing. <laughs> uh, yeah, I uh, 
started the dialogue with Jewish colleagues back in 2007. Um, it happened after a, a task force that I sat on that was meant to address the hate and hate crimes in the province of Ontario, uh, put together by the government. Uh, and as it happened, there was a Jew to my right and a Jew to my left sitting in that task force. And um, this were two individuals who I had known about, who had been sort of advocates for Israel and uh, anti-Semitism, uh, you know, advocating against anti-Semitism and uh, doing that kind of work. Um, and uh, to my surprise, by the end of the work of the task force, I, I realized that I had a lot more in common with them than I thought. Um, and that's because we were all in the human rights work. Uh, we all came from the same kind of uh, value system uh, that says, you know, everybody deserves the same human rights. Uh, and uh, and that common ground uh, sort of piqued my interest into, uh, you know, what else didn't I know, you know, about these Jewish colleagues uh, and their community. And I suggested we we start talking, and and we did, and it's it went on for sixteen years, and it was an amazing learning process. Uh, um, you know, you you learn you don't learn from people who agree with you. You learn from people who disagree with you. You, you get you, that's where you hear new ideas and new perspectives. Um, and one of the things I learned, and at the time I had never heard it before, is that you know, to them, to Jews, Zionism is a movement for self-determination. Uh, you know, I, my narrative growing up uh, in in Lebanon and then working in Palestinian rights uh, here in Canada uh, was that Zionism was a destructive force. Uh, you know, it destroyed Palestinian society in 1948, caused uh, hundreds of thousands to be displaced and uh, dispossessed and so on. So, you know, I, I learned from them that it, to them it's something different. So they don't support Zionism because Zionism was bad to Palestinians, but because Zionism was good to Jews. Um, and they learned from me that everything that Zionism gave them uh, took away from me. Uh, it took away from Palestinians, whether it's land, a homeland, identity, uh, stability, security. Um, so, uh, to cut the long story short, um, you know, I, I wanted to write this book for two reasons. One is to share the learning that I went through in my dialogue process over the years, so that, uh, you know, other Palestinians and Arabs who have not had that uh, privilege can, you know, learn from something that I experienced. And, and the other reason was that, you know, it's I, I was look around the way Jews and Palestinians and Arabs in general here in North America in the diaspora, uh, the distrust, the 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 fear and, and animosity, you know, organizations on both sides, you know, demonizing the other, uh, and I figured, you know, we we should be able to do better rather than you know bring the import the conflict, you know, inflate it here, pour some more gasoline on it. Um, you know, we have our Canadian or American citizenship in common and the values that that comes with, that we should be able to do better than uh, the way we were doing. Uh, and that's clearly a, you know, a long journey, uh, you know, the October 7 events and everything that happened since uh, has, you know, have really pushed the two sides in the wrong direction. Yeah, I think I, I read this book for the first time before October 7th, and I've revisited parts of it since, in part because what we've seen exactly happen is the counter to what you would call for in your book and what you would hope would happen. Um, jumping ahead a little bit to that, how have your thoughts or have your thoughts at all changed about this process with the ongoing moment, or how has it spoken into and informed and shaped how you are responding as individuals or in your communities to this current moment that is one of heightened stress and tension in families and, and neighborhoods and schools on college campuses. How is this work shaping how you are responding and how you're seeing your communities respond? Sure, um, I'm, um, I can start. Um, 
the book and our work is grounded in two basic things. One is the understanding that we have two traumatized peoples, or two groups of victims, and that that trauma isn't past, but present and feared in the future. Um, and that we are guided by human rights and justice for all, and not based on their identity or where they live or what religion they practice. Um, um, excuse me, um, the last uh, six weeks have really grounded those principles. That our first reaction to anyone we talk to, and we've been fortunate to talk to a lot of people, you know, is, is to hear their experience, to hear their trauma, to value of that experience, not through Jewish trauma or Palestinian trauma, but through the essence of pain, grief, and loss. You know, and the other way is that when we feel pushed and pulled by various sides to take a particular position, we focus on human rights and dignity. Those have been our guideposts throughout the work, and they continue to be even stronger anchors to how we think and how we talk. Yeah, what we've seen happen, uh, you know, in terms of reactions by the two communities, uh, I think it's unprecedented in, in my experience uh, to see such polarization, uh, to see such anger, animosity. Um, and it, you know, it proved the two, two of the things that we say in the book. One is that the trauma trauma is deep, as you know, Jeff has said. But also, both tribes have been feeding from the same uh, trough of their community and their tribe, and, and meaning all this over the last years. There's been a lot of demonization happening uh, on uh, by advocacy groups, interest groups, um, who's you know, whose business is to continue advocacy and uh, and planting, you know, seeds of hate is good for that business. Um, and, uh, you know, we, in the book, we give people a choice uh, about, we, we give the reader a choice, you know, do you want to be uh, motivated, driven by your trauma, uh, your tribe, you know, uh, propaganda, disinformation, or do you want to be driven by values, uh, or do you want to be driven by justice? Uh, and uh, right now, unfortunately, the overwhelming majority of people on both sides are driven by the traumas and by uh, the uh, influence of tribal leaders, if you want to call them. And uh, and it's you know it, as Jeff says you know it's it's proof positive of what we said in the book is exactly what happened in the last six weeks. And we wish we had been wrong. We wish we had been wrong. I wish you had been wrong too. As great as the book is, I wish it was yeah headed in a different direction. Jeff and Raja, I'm wondering if you can say a little bit more for us what those traumas are for the Jewish community and the Palestinian community. Um, especially for folks who maybe haven't read the book yet and had a chance to dive into those narratives. For some on this call, they might belong to those communities and are experiencing those traumas present and, and remembered in real time. But for others, those are narratives that we might not be as familiar with. Um, and as we've discussed you know, here tonight and in our ongoing work together, understanding that trauma as kind of a root and a, a meta narrative, as you guys describe it, is so essential to understanding those motivations and the ways people have been acting. Can you describe for us what both of those traumas are and, and how they relate to the histories and the present, uh, the present day for both, both communities? I will uh, ask Dr. Trauma here to oh, go I, I, was hoping, I was hoping you would start. Um, <laughs> um, I'm having a little trouble apparently with my volume. Can everyone hear me okay? Can I just get a clarity that everybody's good? Yeah. I think so. No one has commented that they can't hear you, and normally they would have by now if, if they had issues. So, okay. um, And I'll speak nice and loud. I've got my volume up full, but uh, you know sometimes this happens here. Let me just do one more thing. That might help a little too. Okay, so here we go. Um, um, so we'll start back uh, before October 7th. We'll start with the historical traumas. We, 
I use the term a meta narrative, which is an overarching story that's rooted in your sacred values that are threatened by an experience. So your who you are, your identity, your place in the world, you know, is threatened both by an experience and the memory of that experience. And for Jews, that is the Holocaust primarily, um, um, as well as a history of isolation, um, mistreatment, murder, oppression, you know, all of the terrible things that have happened over, you know, 2000 years to Jews in various parts of the world. Um, well, for Palestinians, um, it's the Nakba or catastrophe of 1948, of the displacement and loss of land. Um, you could look at October 7th and everything that has happened since through those two lenses. Many in my Jewish tribe very emotionally responded to the events of October 7th as linked or somehow an expression of a Holocaust or a repeated Holocaust. You might logically be able to process, you know, that it, as, as horrible as, um, excuse me, October 7th once, it's not comparable to a Holocaust, but emotions they don't really work in a logical, practical fashion. They work in an instantaneous, reactive fashion that, um, excuse me, I'm sorry, uh, protects us from pain as much as we, you know, are able to. Um, and for Palestinians, and I'm sure Raja will say more, I think it's really important to get how the Nakba has not only been revisited throughout the last 75 years in various forms, the blockade, um, occupation, but there are specific links to the events since October 7th, being told or ordered to move south and having the fear that they will not be able to come back north or even the fear of being pushed out, excuse me, altogether to Jordan or to Egypt and not be able to return. These are real live fears that are stimulated and, 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 and heightened because of the memories of uh, 75 years of feeling that. And I think that we, we, we usually misunderstand that an event is powered by the moment and it's really powered by the past and the memory and the fear of future. And so it's, it's a magnifying operation that we're seeing right now. One, one unfortunate uh, thing uh, taking place uh, here in, in North America is that uh, the general public is is able to to link what happened on October seven to Jewish uh, to the Holocaust to centuries of anti-Semitism um, and became naturally very sort of protective and uh, sympathetic to to their you know their their plight and their condition, um, but you know maybe. I'll probably be generous if I said one percent of the people of, of North and North, sorry, in North America uh, would have heard about the Nakba, and uh, and and they're unable, therefore, to find a hook to put their understanding, uh, or to to ground their understanding of how the Palestinians are reacting or why, into something that is uh, known to them. So uh, when something like uh, October seven happens, and you, you know you're not familiar with the situation, you're not familiar with the history, and you don't realize that you know these people in Gaza have been living under blockade for sixteen years, and the people in the West Bank, uh, you know, under occupation for fifty six years, that eighty percent of the people in Gaza were themselves refugees from historic Palestine. And now, you know, the, the, if you don't know all of that, then you look at what the Palestinians did and you say, you know, how barbaric, how brutal, you know, why would they do this? Uh, reminds me of 9-11, you know, people, many Americans were asking, you know, why would they, why do they hate us? Why do they do this? Well, you know, I mean, look at your history and you get, get some inkling and, uh, don't get me wrong, none of this justifies the brutality of any attack, whether October 7 or every day after that or 
But like the Secretary General of the United Nations says, you know, October 7 did not happen in a vacuum. There's a context. And it didn't happen because Palestinians are, you know, uh, genetically inclined to commit violence and hate Jews. Uh, that's a very wrong interpretation. Um, this attack was a political act against an, a state entity. But, uh, you know, as Jeff, re, you know, reminds me often, to people, they don't see it that way. To Jews, they see it as attack on Jews. So, yes, they attack civilians. I, I, I get that. Um, Israel has been attacking civilians too. Both sides are wrong and and, and that kind of... Uh, the, but both sides are committing war crimes. Thank you both for illustrating some of those those deep narratives and how they're at play in this moment. Um, one of the things we practice at Telos is holding perspectives in tension and in this moment, in this conversation, that looks like holding those meta narratives in tension. And one of the things that I have run into as an individual engaging this and, and through Telos as well, is that there's often a, a comparison of trauma or, well, my trauma supersedes yours, or they, there's not space for both of them. Um, and I know in this book and in your bigger work, that's totally contrary to what you both are trying to do. It's through the recognition of these traumas, not the comparison of them, but the, the recognition of the ways that they're at play, that we move beyond that us versus them having to decide between them. Can you say a little bit more or, or give us some insight or tips on how to do that gracefully when sometimes we encounter folks who are in the midst of a trauma response or who are deeply afraid and, and reacting out of that place of fear, who don't want to see us doing that or don't like the idea that we're holding these things in tension? How can you help us respond in those moments oriented towards that justice and, and need for collective uh, human rights and all of that um, without feeling like we are being insensitive to those people in that moment. Sure. Well, I think we can give you some practical examples from our talks, from our book talks. Um, uh, we spoke four days after October 7th with a, um, at a college campus in the U.S. Uh, to a pretty largely Palestinian or pro, um, um, and pro-Palestinian audience um, who immediately took our resistance to violence as a, you know, sort of equivocation of the violence of the oppressed and the oppressor. Uh, they found that very difficult to handle. So the very thirst, the main thing we did first is to show compassion. Of course, you feel that. You are, this is, you, you are deeply aware of the Palestinian experience. Most are not. You are reacting out of that pain, out of that a multiplication of pain that happens over and over and the fact that your position is a minority position where you are living and speaking so you're not only dealing with what's happening over there you're dealing with being um uh, mistreated called names doxxed etc etc um, um in a recent talk um a jewish woman um, from israel you know I stood up and openly said that, you know, she was she was struggling with our message, that, you know, she had a human rights bent, she cared very much for Palestinians, but it was really tough on her. You know, and again, it was compassion. Of course you feel that way. Is there any way we can help? Is there any way we can, you know, have you clear that we care deeply about your concerns and that seeing and visibility of the other we have been taught really to take as a diminution of our story. And it isn't, it isn't a zero sum game. It isn't, I gain, you lose. The, the more I learned from Raja and understood his personal experience as a Palestinian, the more fulfilled I felt not only as a human, but as a Jew. I learned about the land that, you know, of Eretz Israel from a completely different perspective. I became, more compassionate, deeper, bigger human being. Learning about the other is a gift. And we have in many ways been taught that it's fearful and that we need to be careful. And I, 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 that's the main message we do is widen your circle, make it bigger, include stories that you had, feel threatened, that you had felt threatened by and create space to allow yourself to realize that it's not threatening that it's a gift. 
you know, some, some people asked us uh, uh, if uh, if we, between Jeff and I, if we faced uh, any challenges uh, uh, to our relationship, uh, if we had any arguments or disagreements, or and the answer is no. Uh, and and the reason for that is because we're similarly motivated by the the values of justice and human rights and listening and learning from the other. And, uh, you know, we're not saints uh, and uh, we're not naive. Speak for yourself, please. <laughs> you're Dr. Trauma. You're not going to become Dr. Saint. <laughs> it's beyond, beyond your reach. Right. You um, and, you know, it's uh, we are blessed that way that we met, you know, and uh, are, we're quickly able to become uh, not just good, good colleagues, but friends, and uh, um, it's doable. You know, it's it's doable. Uh, on on October first, uh, we had a big reception here in Toronto uh, to celebrate the book, the release of the book. Uh, over a hundred people at a nice art gallery downtown Toronto, and uh, you know there were Jews, Zionists. Palestinians, Arabs, Muslims, Christians, everybody was in the room. And it was a it was a real mood of celebration, support for our message. Um, and you know, we we got lucky that the reception was before October 7 because it would have been very, very different. Otherwise, we probably couldn't have had it in the first place, but the reactions in the room certainly would have been very different because emotions are high and people are are not dealing with things uh, logically, mostly it's emotionally. Uh, people are hearing not what you're saying, but what they think you are saying. Um, and there's very little listening going on. I mean, you know, if you look at the exchanges online, it's just disgusting. One of the things I appreciate so deeply about this book and the ongoing work you've done is that it does build the kind of resilience we need to see in communities when events like this happen. So we right, we exercise the muscles before we need to use them in moments of heightened crisis. And so, um, right, hopefully this, this escalation will end as soon as possible, but we know that the long-term work continues. And I am, I'm glad that there is this resource out there for continues, for communities to use to continue engaging each other's narratives in moments when that emotion has calmed down. One of the other principles at Telos is that deep authentic relationships across lines of difference fuel transformation. And I think that your relationship embodies that so wonderfully and so clearly. And the work you do really exemplifies what comes out of that type of authentic relationship where you are deeply listening. For those of us who don't live in places with large Jewish communities or large Palestinian communities or we might know some folks, but want to dive into those narratives. How would you encourage people to lean into those types of stories or different meta narratives um, from a position of curiosity if it's harder to find those personal relationships? What resources would you recommend to all of us? Do you want to start? After you, sir. <laughs> um, so just kind of pause. We have to say, you know, to your audience that we are doing our best to replicate our in-person, you know, way of being. It's different online, but note that in all of our talks, and sometimes we've had, you know, 150 people, we start with warmth, maybe a little humor, you know, gentle jabbing back and forth, because it is difficult. And we are people first. I am Jewish as part of my identity. It isn't all of who I am or all, or all how I relate with others. It is an important part, but it isn't all of it. So I just, you know, and I wanna offer to all the people here that in your own way, you're dealing with something since October 7th. I know a few of you, and I know you're dealing deeply every day, um, excuse me, with this and others, you know, perhaps it's a smaller part of your life. So the first advice I give is it's always best to start with yourself, to start with your own experience. 
so before you even you know go into Palestinian um, uh, Palestinian and Israeli discourse, you know, uh, talk about or explore experiences in your own life that you can identify with of uh, places where you have uh, thought about um, oppression and oppressor, where you've thought about privilege, where you can examine uh, places that you've learned something that you didn't know before, that you've met someone who was very different than you and you talk to them. So if you have sort of that grounding first, when you go into this conversation, it's this has the same parameters as any other othering um, experience where you have an experience that you know that you're comfortable with and you have one that you don't. You have an experience that, you know, adds to your sense of belonging and identity and you, and you have an othering experience of something that is either just not known or is uncomfortable. Um, the last thing I'd say about this discourse particularly is I don't know of another story now, even before October 7th, that takes up as most, um, 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 excuse me, as much a political and emotional space as Israel Palestine. It is an outsized experience that we live with for lots of reasons, um, most of which we detail in the book. But, you know, it's a relatively small place, you know, 10,000 miles. Up, um, 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 10,000 miles from the U.S. It's a long way away. Um, yet it takes up a lot of our space because there is a meta narrative around Jews and Arabs that is central to our identity as Western people. Jews in general are a story that we know, a story that we have felt very, most of us collectively have felt guilty about. Um, because of centuries of anti-Semitism, because of the absolutely horrific response of the West uh, before and during the Holocaust. Um, so there is there two things. There's guilt around Jews, and there's also, you know, somewhat of a sense of fraternity, of, of likeness, you know, of bonding. For the most part, um, Arabs and Muslims are outside of most of our sphere. And the general meta narrative in uh, the US and Canada is that there historically has been something to be cautious or afraid of. You know, and I think it's really important to enter these stories with that awareness that there's a prejudged bias to how we have experienced these two stories here in Canada and the US. So just be really aware of it. Uh, don't be frightened by it, just be aware of it. And when, when you, you know, start uh, wanting to talk and listen to the other, you're starting from a, a point of distrust. And uh, it will take a while to build that trust. Um, and, and, and you know you've reached that level of trust when you believe that what the other person is saying to you they're saying it because they believe it and they're not saying it to put you down or score points. So it takes a while to get there. Um, and, and you know, I think initially the easiest approach to starting these kinds of conversations is to tell personal stories. Here's my story. Here's my, my parents went through. Uh, getting to know but also in a non-threatening way nobody can argue with you about your story uh, you know, unless you politicize it but um so uh what are we talking about <laughs> <laughs> we're talking about you know what we're talking about <laughs> we're talking about supporting of people who are dipping their toes into this conversation, perhaps for the first yeah, time. Yeah, yeah, and and uh, there are you know too few people do this. Um, and another suggestion I would make is have an experienced sort of facilitator help you with these conversations, at least in the early days, uh, so that when people start overacting. Uh, getting emotional, maybe getting a little abusive in their language, 
you need someone to kind of jump things down and keep them, you know, uh, establish norms, keep them within the norms and, and, and all that. Until the trust builds, you will need much less of that. Once the trust builds, it uh, becomes, it's still a difficult conversation because there's a disagreement. But uh, uh, you 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 know you will learn to respectfully disagree, uh, and not to see the other person as uh, as evil because they they think that way or they say something like that. Yeah. Um, um, I'm I'm going to add something sort of outrageous, which is that we have an over deeply overinflated value of our own opinion. Um, it's natural. It's how we sort of feel important it's normal i have it you know of course raja does not but but i do and you know really in deep listening your opinion is pretty much inconsequential i don't at the beginning i don't ask i don't spout my opinion and i don't ask for someone else's i ask them how they feel and i share how i feel i share what i'm struggling with you know are we say in the book to listen to understand, not listen to respond. So my first, you know, coaching to everyone is, is that it's just so easy to think that our opinion is somehow important. In learning, in deep learning, our own opinion is more of an obstacle than a help. Yeah, so much wisdom yeah. from both of you. And and it's bringing up for me our first two practices of peacemaking again, which are listening to understand and holding perspectives in tension. And the way we frame our version of listening to understand, which I think dovetails exactly with what you were just saying, Jeff, is that it's really powerful to seek to listen to understand before seeking to be understood. And there's something really powerful and, and opens up space for vulnerability in that connection when you offer someone the gift of the space to listen to, as Raja, you were saying, their deep story and the story of their family and their pain and their perspective. And to do that before you share your own builds those bonds and that trust and relationship in a way that is incredibly powerful. And, you know, one, one more thing is that uh, uh, you... Uh, you need to be able to question what you know and and how do you know it mm. let me give an example uh you'll talk to a zionist even a progressive zionist and they would tell you if only the arabs had accepted the partition plan then everybody would have been living in peace and the palestinians wouldn't be in the condition that they are in now so they say this as if they know it. But of course, nobody knows what would have happened if they had accepted the plan. There could have been a war six months later anyway. You don't know, you know, if, what if, but you're still putting forward an idea and you're sure of it. Now, of course, this idea was given to you by someone else and it, it resonated with you because you don't want to take responsibility for what happened in 1948. So you put the responsibility on the Palestinians because, well, they didn't accept the peace plan or the partition plan, sorry. And therefore, you know, they got what they deserved or too bad, but it wasn't our fault. Um, you know, a Palestinian or an Arab would tell you Israel wants to take over Lebanon and Syria and Jordan and even to reach the Euphrates because they can find some biblical references to Eretz Israel and so on and so forth. Uh, they will tell you that as if they know it. But of course, no one really knows it. So uh, in a, you need to be ready to discharge yourself of these notions that things that you know are true uh, or are fact. Yeah, um, there's an expression that we often use in sort of trauma and memory work, which uh, I'm sure you've heard, uh, Sarah, it's called a witsiati. <laughs> and what it means is what you see is all there is. Mm. And just recognize that what we see is, you know, it's like this. I mean, we've all said that we have blind spots. I, um, I've been saying for a while, I think we have vision spots. We actually only see a small part. Most mm -hmm. of it 
is outside of our, uh, excuse me, our field of vision. Yeah. So I, I, I think that's, for me, that's very humbling. I, I assume when I talk to someone that I'm seeing a small portion of their reality, not the whole thing. Yeah, there, there are two words or values that come up as both of you have just shared and they're humility and curiosity. And I think that those go hand in hand with everything you were just describing. The humility to say, we don't see the full picture. We don't have all the answers. And then the curiosity that has to come with that to say, how can I fill in those missing pieces or how can I expand my vision or engage perspectives that are different from my own? Um, and to me, those, those link then too, Jeff, to what you were saying a little bit earlier about bias because part of humility and curiosity is recognizing the ways we are not showing up the way we want to or the ways we might be doing harm. One of our other practices is called self-interrogation, examining the ways we in our communities might unwittingly be involved in ways we don't wanna be. We might be doing harm. We might hold biases or assumptions about others. We, we otherize folks. You talked a little bit, Raja, as you were opening your remarks or introducing yourself a little bit more in your relationship with Jeff, that this has been personally transformative work for you. And I, I wouldn't put both of you on the spot, except I know that you'll be okay with it. And, and you share very openly about this as part of your work. I wonder if you would share with us what that process of self-interrogation was like as you wrote this book or as you've engaged in this work together. Don't have to tell us the whole story or, or bear your entire soul, but what's one piece that really surprised you that you now see differently from before you began this work together? What's one bias or blind spot or vision expansion that was particularly impactful for you in this book writing process? Well, one, one very important thing I, I, I learned from Jeff is that uh, um, about Jewish values and um how they drive him to be the person that he is that somehow ended up being similar to what I am in terms of my values um and uh you know contrary to sort of the prevailing narrative among Palestinians and Arabs uh, um you know that You know, they 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 unfortunately many people unfortunately go into sort of anti-Semitic tropes, uh, um, you know, driven by their anger and frustration, um, and uh, you know they they don't necessarily see as Jews wanting to have a land of their own as a as a as a reality rather than an excuse to take over Palestine. Uh, and and as I you know write in the book is you know if 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 Jews had gone and, and taken a land piece of land in northern Canada somewhere that I don't think you know Palestinians would have bothered with you know Zionism or whether you know Jews are a people uh, you know or they're acting the way they are because they are Jewish. Uh, they do make a distinction between Palestinian, sorry, between Jews and Zionists. Uh, but then, you know, they, they tell you uh, something like, well, but most Jews are Zionists anyway. So I, I learned about, you know, Judaism uh, uh, as, a, as a value system uh, that uh, is very powerful if you know, if you're able to live it the way Jeff lives it. I mean, I, I joke with him sometimes, I call him Saint Jeffrey, because, you know, he's he's so driven by his values and principles and uh, the compassion that he has. And, you know, he reminds me every once in a while, he says, it comes from my Judaism. So that's, that's a, you know, a big learning piece for me was... That's um, really powerful, Raja. Thank you for sharing. Um, I mean, there's many, many things. I'll start with one of my first learnings from Raja. It was actually before we started writing the book. It was during uh, my dissertation process. Um, I was interviewing him in his office. And, you know, I was always very aware, you know, of my experience of my tribe being nomadic, being, you know, displaced over and over again and feeling that they couldn't be 
on the student themselves or practice our traditions. But when Rajat told me that when, you know, actually in Lebanon, you know, as Palestinian, as his parents and his family were Palestinian refugees, um, that he learned how to speak Lebanese Arabic to guards, soldiers, because it was dangerous to say words like tomato, you know, in a way that that outed him as Palestinian. And that just so struck me because I had never considered the, I, I, I certainly had known, you know, to a large extent, the pain of having to leave. But I didn't, I hadn't considered the ongoing pain of being an outsider everywhere that Palestinians had to go. And that that was a real mind shift for me that 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 completely changed my perspective on uh, the Palestinian experience. Just to clarify, that was during the Lebanese Civil War, and it wasn't soldiers; it was militias. But yeah, they they would you know stop the car and show you a a tomato and say, you know, an Arabic card. What is this? Um, if you we can pronounce it with a Lebanese dialect or with a Palestinian one, and um, it's a it happened it happened frequently. Thank you, Jeff and Raja. I think for me, what both of those stories illustrate is the again the depth and the nuance of experience that those of us who don't engage these issues with curiosity completely miss when we only talk about meta narratives, which is so important, but really diving into personal impact and personal stories is what lets us understand the individual human implication of all of this, which at the end of the day is why we do what we do, because we care about individual people and, and not just policy and political goals, but the real lives and, and flourishing of our, our friends and our communities in Israel, Palestine, but then also at home in the US and Canada and wherever folks are, are tuning in from. Um, 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 I just wanted to say, Sarah, I know you're going to do this anyway, but I want to be sure, you know, we've had a lovely, a lovely conversation. I, I hope have uplifted people's spirits, but I also know that people are struggling with deep issues in their communities. And I, I want to make sure, and you know, as I know you do, that we have opportunities to answer challenging questions and to explore maybe a topic that we haven't talked about yet. Yeah, Jeff, that's exactly where I wanted to turn to next. So you are right on my list of what I'd hoped to cover. Um, folks who are joining us, this is the chance to talk to Jeff and Raja, who are expert facilitators in their own right, who do this in their communities, who consult with other communities. So as you have questions about the book or about how to use what they teach in their book, um, please either raise your hand or feel free to put your questions in the chat. That's where we're going to turn to next. I have one kind of bridging question there, Jeff, as we invite folks to gather their thoughts and know that it's it's time for them to be invited to join the conversation. But the question was, you know, for those of us on the call or those of us in, this, in the U.S. and Canada where this feels very far away, why is it important for us to engage a topic or these meta narratives that feel like they're so divorced from us in our communities? Like, I have my own answer, but I'd love to hear your guys' answer on why it's so important for us to tune into care and to do this work, even if we're not Jewish or Palestinian. Here you go. Really, I, I, I could hear your answer, Raj. I, I know him well enough that I know his answers. I was looking forward oh. to it. You'll do it next. Anyway, um, on my two perspectives. First of all, as someone who you should, most of the time lives in Canada, um, I always start with the indigenous experience. I, they start with the fact that I live as a colonizer and settler in my land and that the advantages and privileges I had is because it was taken from someone else who had it first. So that's the first importance to me. I can't choose which indigenous people I support, you know, and um, I see Palestinians and in some ways Jews as indigenous in the land in different ways, not in the same way. And I support differentially their need and concern um, to have space and land to be safe, to flourish, and to have equal rights. So it, it, th uh, that's my first approach. The second is we in the West are culpable for what's happening in Israel-Palestine. It is our 
particularly in the U.S., our policies and approach to Israel that has allowed the inequities to stay in place for so long. And we are therefore responsible. We vote. We have the ability to write to politicians. We vote for them, you know, in or out. So all of us in our own way are culpable for the ongoing oppression of Palestinians in um, Israel-Palestine. Yeah, I mean, we, we provide political cover. The West provides a lot of political cover uh, for for Israel. Um, you know, not, not a single Western leader has stood up and said, uh, you know, enough already, enough people have died, we need a ceasefire. Um, uh, you know, no one has um, said anything about, uh, you know, aside from some people in the UN, uh, and everyone was quick to claim to say that uh, Hamas's actions on October 7, uh, you know, was a war crime. Uh, but then the war crimes committed by Israel after that, and that, you know, and bombing civilian areas of flattening, flattening entire neighborhoods, we, we don't, you know, Western leaders are not talking about that. Um, and whenever they express, express sympathy, uh, to you know the suffering of Palestinians in Gaza, civilians. Uh, they talk about it as if you know it's 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 a natural naturally occurring disaster that's killing people. Yeah. They don't even you know rarely do they assign blame to the people who are bombing them. Um, we see Israel as part of the West, uh, as a strategic ally. Uh, one reason we keep hearing about how Israel is the only democracy in the Middle East is to remind us that, you know, they are like us, the other guys are not. Um, and uh, uh, so, you know, if w when you do that, then you, you have to be responsible for uh, your actions. Uh, you know, we are letting... Uh, something resembling a genocide happened before our eyes. Uh, the, you know, the empathy to Palestinians that was given to, you know, Jews after October 7th has yet to materialize. Uh, so I don't know. I mean, you know, what more does it take than seeing babies and children uh, dying in the thousands? Uh, so the positions that we take uh, make us uh, irresponsible and culpable to the outcomes of these uh, positions. Thank you both. I just put some resources in the chat for if you're in the U.S. calling your members of Congress. We know that calling for a ceasefire and the return of hostages doesn't fix the underlying issues, but it's something that we all can and should and need to continue doing to save lives and end immediate direct violence today, rather yesterday, but today. Um, so please, if you haven't called yet, that's one really powerful way we can take accountability and then try and work for the better. Um, even if it feels like it's a, a small drop in the bucket, those calls are really important and taking action matters. The other piece I'll say, because Jeff and Raja, you know, I know I've learned so much from you both about this too, is the importance of doing this work locally in your communities, calling out anti-Semitism where you see it, or inviting folks into caring about Jewish communities and Palestinian communities at the same time. Those are really powerful actions as well. We're starting to get some questions in the chat. So uh, if you're comfortable, um, I'll invite you to unmute. And I'll also say, I know Jeff and Raja really well. If you're worried that you don't know how to ask your question perfectly, or you're worried about saying something wrong that might offend someone, they're very hard to offend. They will respond with grace and give a lot of insight and help into whatever you were wondering. So please don't feel like this is a space where you, you can't ask a question that's not fully formed. So David, I'll invite you to unmute yourself and, and ask your question first, if you are up for that. I don't think there's a David, is there? Oh, a Davida. I'm so yeah. sorry. I am wearing my glasses because I'm having a problem with one of my eyes. So Davida, sorry about that. Well, she's the question is is there already. Yeah, I can go ahead and read it then. Yeah. Um okay. Did she want to? Um, can you hear me? Want... 
Yeah, go ahead, Davida. Okay, it's actually Diane. I'm with Davida. It's not her question. Um, I'm, you know, deeply concerned about Hamas and the way they treat the Palestinians. And to me, it, it seems that the Palestinian people would be much better off if Hamas was not there. Um, and so how do we take all of this into account and what do we do? I'll, I'll, uh, I'll take that. Of course you will. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> see, I was saving myself for the tough questions. <laughs> yeah, thank, thank you. Thank you, my friend. Um, let, let me tell you about Hamas. You know, first of all, I, 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 have, I don't have any sympathies for Hamas for a number of reasons. Uh, they are a, an Islamist, and, and I don't believe that politics and religion should mix. Mm -hmm. uh, they are patriarchal. Uh, they're very conservative, and um, and they can be very violent, uh, you know, as as we've seen. Uh, that said, they remain the only Palestinian resistance, armed resistance, left to Palestinians. And for people who have been under siege for sixteen years with occasional bombing. I mean, this is not the first time, this is just the worst time. But we've had many occasions before where Gaza was bombed and hundreds or thousands were killed, uh, living in a place with no hope, no future, and no access to the outside world. Um, if you want to, if you're a, a student who wants to go study in a university abroad from Gaza, it can take you three to four years to get permission if you get it. Mm -hmm. You're under the complete control of a foreign government that controls your air, your sea, everything that comes in and out into this territory. Uh, the poverty levels are very high. Unemployment is very high. You live in miserable conditions. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know what I would do if I lived under these conditions. Um, you know, it, do they produce this kind of violence? I don't know. But th when people live a violent life, it's a violent life. Mm -hmm. You know, we are unaware of it here in the West because we only pay attention when there's shooting. And we, we wonder what's happening why is this happening well the violence did not start on october 7th uh it started uh you know maybe a hundred years ago and uh you know you cannot expect a population to live under these conditions indefinitely um uh, so if we want to make this issue a problem of hamas we are mistaken. Hamas is a symptom. It's not the problem. Uh, the problem um, is the ongoing oppression uh, of the Palestinians that has been going on for decades. And that cannot go on indefinitely. And um, I, I mean, I'll just add, if, sorry, did you want to say something else before I add? Go ahead. Um, yeah. Um, you know, I, I hear the term occupation of Gaza, but my understanding is that since 2005, um, Gaza was not occupied by Israel, and that, you know, I, I, I know a lot of money is justifiably given to the Palestinians to improve their situation, but it, it seems like Hamas steals you know, the cement and makes the terror tunnels and steals the fuel and the water and prevents, you know, some of the people from leaving the hospitals and fires on them. Um, how how do know, we know and, that? How, how do we know that, Davida? Diane, Diane. Um, oh, sorry, sorry, Diane. Um, from very different. <laughs> from, well, the way that we know any anything, you know, from some you know, reliable news sources from, you know, um, I mean, we do know that billions of dollars over the years have been given to the Palestinians. I, I think we could all agree that that's factual and it doesn't seem like 
regardless of if the Palestinians did or did not build terror tunnels, um, that where has that money gone? What has been done with it? Why haven't the Palestinian people benefit from that? I think that's, you know, really sad. So I'm going to add a little broadening to the story, if I might. So uh, this idea of occupation is really, really important because it's very common in Western media. And I think we need to make sure that we're dealing with the facts. Um, uh, Gaza is considered occupied, absolutely occupied by international law. It isn't technically occupied the way the West Bank or East Jerusalem is. But Israel controls, and Egypt, Egypt is also culpable on the southern border of Gaza, controls everything that goes in, everything that goes out, who goes in, who goes out. So it is a de facto occupation. And the reason Israel left was not to relieve the suffering of Palestinians, but because Gaza is an impossible place to manage. And it was very costly to Israel, both monetarily and in soldiers and lives and safety. So I, I think it's a major misconception that we have in the West that Israel said, oh, you guys, you know, we'll leave and you just messed it all up. I also want to make sure that we're very clear. There is a gigantic dearth in leadership in all parties, in the Palestinian side, in the Jewish side over there in the Israeli government and in the Jewish leadership abroad. There is a dearth of morally centered, peace-driven leadership. And there's plenty of blame to go around. And as we've said really clearly, we're not fans of Hamas. It's just important to understand if, if this experience, which it is for us, is about getting into the heart and soul of the other, I can tell you from literally hundreds of conversations that the way most Palestinians experience Hamas as a group they wish were not their leaders mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and that there is no other resistance other than Hamas. And so when you hear people say you have to value the resistance and Jews and others feel like, well, oh, you're supporting Hamas, you're supporting violence, you're saying that if you oppress a people, they will resist. You cannot militarize or to be crude, you can't kill your way out of this problem. It is mm -hmm. impossible. If you were to get rid of Hamas, you know, having flattened half of Gaza and killed tens of thousands of people, can you imagine that anything better would replace them? So it, this isn't a, it, you know, we hear this or we hear that. This is plenty of blame to go around. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. if our focus is human rights and dignity, none of us would be able, I would say, to live in Gaza or the West Bank and not be angry. Mm -hmm. It would be impossible. And our Western safety allows us to think, oh, well, you know, if it were me, I would do better. Uh, no, we would not do better. Oh, I realize it's a disastrous situation with no easy answers, for sure. But um, I would love to hear some of your a proposal, <laughs> an idea that might, short the, of killing everybody, how you how uh, you move along. The, the, the two peoples, the Jews and the Palestinians, have to figure out a way to share the land. For the last 75 years, have they have failed to do that. They, they have not been able to share the land in a way that was you know, just and met each people's minimum needs. Uh, you know, if it takes another 75 years before that happens, it's a shame because everyone that, who dies between now and then is an unnecessary death. But that's the way things you know, have been going. And we do not, proposed to be, you know, political uh, experts who can propose political solutions. That's not our field. Uh, our point from this book was to get us here in the West and in, in North America to at least start shouting and cursing at each other and 
continuing to be part of the problem and rather than that just become part of the solution. And uh, a few of us have done that. A few of us have been working in that uh, in that uh, uh, in that domain, but uh, most of us are are not thinking like that. Most of us are, are fed propaganda, and that propaganda makes us hate each other, become very tribal and distrustful of anyone else. Um, for us here, this is what we need to be doing. Yeah. Absolutely. And I, you know, we often get a question about, you know, can you present a grand plan? And we usually stick handle around it. Um, but I do want to say this about it. There is no long-term solution that doesn't involve justice and rights. <laughs> That's, we have been talking about peace for a long time. It's the wrong conversation. The conversation is about justice. Mm -hmm. Very important to hear that. Uh, Martin Luther King said that without justice, there is no peace. That peace is not the pres the absence of war, but the presence of justice. And what is missing, you know, in Israel Palestine and our approach to Israel Palestine is a just approach, approach that values every life equally, that puts begins to put some curtains between past and present to create a new future both sides are deeply angry for many many reasons to healing if any of i'm sure anyone here can you know say a place a relationship a, a parent a sibling partner where you've experienced healing it involved some form of curtaining the past and the present Mm -hmm. of recognizing the past and and putting a barrier between what was and what is, between what is happening now and what was happening. Mm -hmm. This is the same in a broader conflict like this, you mm -hmm. a struggle like this, is you mm -hmm. have to begin to put curtains and separations. For Palestinians, I'll just say in my learning, this is exceptionally hard because there is no division between past and present. What they experienced 75 years ago, they're still experiencing and sometimes worse. So there is no way to expect them to draw that curtain until there is an opportunity to have relief from that suffering, from that daily grind. I, I agree with you. I mean, even if Israel were to totally back off and no matter what, Hamas did to Israel, I think we'd still be faced with the same problem that the Palestinians are not going to be helped by Hamas. No. And well, I think that's see. like a major part of all this. No, Focusing I agree. And Jeff and Raj, you can decide how much more time you want to spend on this question yeah, or when you want to move on. I just want I'm, to acknowledge that too. But thank you both yeah, Davida and yeah, Diana for your question. Yeah, Jeff and Raj, yeah, go I'll ahead. I'll just make one last Point. You know, I, I repeat that focusing too much on Hamas is misguided. Once you realize that to Palestinians, Hamas is the resistance, you cannot destroy the resistance the way Netanyahu said, I'm going to go in there and destroy Hamas. You cannot destroy the resistance. People are con going to continue to resist until the conditions that make them resist are gone. And don't forget, and this has been a lot in the news lately, that Netanyahu strengthened Hamas because it served his political agenda. He, he strengthened Hamas so that he would weaken the Palestinian Authority. And he can say, we have no partner for peace. He never wanted to have two states. And Hamas was a good foil for avoiding that kind of conversation for him. And that's why he was very happy to have them there. Now, let's move on. Thanks for those questions and those answers, you both. Um, I'm going to put the tell us principles and practices of peacemaking in the chat again. Um, I know Jeff and Raja have their own approach to this, but I, I think from a tell us perspective, those are helpful in that they lay out the vision that we are working towards, which we call mutual flourishing, which is freedom, dignity, security, and human rights for Israelis and Palestinians in equal measure, which means that freedom, dignity, and security, and human rights for one people can never come at the cost of another. 
uh, like Jeff said, peace and justice are intertwined. And the way I personally approach right, all of these big international political questions or questions of leadership or solutions are to, to support ones that point us towards mutual flourishing, that enhance the freedom, dignity, security, human rights of Israelis and Palestinians in equal measure, not at the cost of the other, and to, to move away from or to work to change the ones that do uphold that binary. Um, sorry, Jeff and Raja, not to interject my own perspective or tell us this perspective, but I think if, if this is something you're struggling with or you're wanting more guidance from, check that out as a resource that might help with these conversations as well. Stephen, I think you had the next question, if you would like to unmute and ask yours. Or sorry, Robert, my bad, Robert. Yeah, I think my question has already been largely answered that there that you're not going to um, delve into practical solutions because it's not your place. But I agree with Jeffrey that there's a that there's a dearth of, of leadership on both sides. And that's a big part of the problem. I think the as, as it happens in our country, the conversation is sort of run from the extremes, you know, whereas the vast mid middle, you know, just wants the same things for their family and for their life. And, um, you know, but given what happened and, and my heart breaks for the civilians on both sides. But, you know, given what happened on October 7th, I mean, Israel as is a sovereign country, its main purpose is to defend its population. I'm sure Hamas in some ways to advance their goals it was looking for the kind of reaction that they got and again i'm just struck with you know how how little practical solutions there are to given what happened on october 7th how israel could have responded and i don't know maybe you can give me your own perspective on that well i mean i can start raja has i, I know um always has a excuse me i'm excellent wisdom on this question um I, I can tell you where my lens goes. The term defense, I believe, has been misused. Not just over there, but over here. Uh, so for instance, in Canada, maybe it's the same in the US. It used to be called, like Department of Defense used, uh, used to be called the War Department. Uh, somewhere along the way, we came up with the sort of more softer term we call defense. Uh, to a person who was killed in their family who's left behind, there isn't any difference between death by defense or by um, hostile action. So it just would really encourage us. There's a lot of tropes around these conversations that are really easy you know, to grasp. Israel has the right to defend itself. And of course, you are right, every sovereign country has the right to defend itself. But we will ask, at what cost? You know, at what cost is defense? Do we also, do we not also have a duty, not only to defend ourselves, but to defend life, to defend values? And I'm gonna, I'm gonna pass it over to my partner. Yeah, look, the, I mean, let us not forget that the the same government that had the is, Israeli populace was protesting in the streets of Tel Aviv and Jerusalem and other places uh, that, you know, half Israelis did not trust to to govern properly, to, to maintain the kind of democracy that Israel has. Um, is the same government that is making have been making the decisions since October seventh, and it's the same government that allowed October seventh to happen. And what they're doing now is just killing people. It, it's it's not going to resolve the issue. They are, you know, showing their anger, uh, showing the Israeli people that they're doing something. But they're not solving any problems. If you believe, like I do, that you cannot destroy Hamas, then what's the point of killing all of these people? If you want to capture Hamas's leadership, use your intelligence. You know, send in uh, trained squads to to find them and capture them. Uh, but flattening entire neighborhoods is not a, a response. I mean. 
I've heard the word barbaric so much uh, on and after October seven, uh, and 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 but that what Israel is doing in Gaza now is not barbaric. If you don't think the killing of thousand five thousand children needlessly is not barbaric, then you know we have different values. Thanks for your question, Robert. One piece I want to add, if you don't mind, both of you, picking up on that idea of peace and justice being intertwined, um, the way we've described that is that working for peace without justice is unserious, empty, and dangerous. Working for justice without concern for healing and reconciliation can degenerate into violence and revenge. And what both of you just said about the Israeli response and then balancing it with defense and how we, we justify things that are unjustifiable in the name of some other things, um, you know, what we see right now has crossed the line into violence and revenge and not justice. And while war crimes don't justify war crimes, all, all violence against civilian life needs to be held accountable. That doesn't look like the kind of retribution and, and revenge that not only keeps there from being peace, but pushes us further from justice in the long run. Right. So I just wanted to add that into the conversation, tying through some of the threads that we had from before and, and your very great answers right now. So thank you for your question, Robert. Um, um, Mr. Sarah, I just want to be very clear, you know, on our approach and what we believe in. Um, uh, these last couple of questions we've we've answered very directly, and I think it was important to do so. But please also note, it's not without a wider awareness. You know, Raja said he doesn't know what he would do. If he lived in Gaza. I don't know if I lived in the settlement, the uh, not the settlement of the kibbutz that you know over a quarter of their membership was killed. I I don't know how I would respond. I hope I know how I would respond, but I don't know. So we're not sitting here talking in a vacuum about easy things. We're saying use values as your anchor. And some of that requires us to interrogate our Western thinking, the way that we have seen ourselves as stratifying violence, areas of violence that we see are completely unacceptable and others for a certain cause we believe is acceptable. This is a trap that we've been fed and pulled into for a very long time. I don't want you to walk away thinking just about over there. We have culpability in how we think about violence. Uh, Martin Luther King also said that to, to participate in violence is to give up one's moral obligation. And I, I think we are, we have a dearth of morality and ethical direction um, here in our society. And we, we take sides and we accept things from our side that we would never accept from the other. I think that we need to take a good hard look at that. That's a really um, important point. I, I urge everyone to diversify their news sources as much as possible. Um, it's it's all available these days. Everything is found online. Uh, a, a, a mainstream American networks are seriously biased and are only telling part of the picture. Uh, you know, there's watch BBC, watch Al Jazeera English, uh, lots of news websites uh, in the region, everywhere. Um, but we've seen what happens when people watch Fox News only uh, or watch MSNBC only. They live in that bubble and they don't see anything beyond it. Uh, if you watch CNN, you will have a very different perceptive, perce perspective of what is happening there than if you watch uh, you know, uh, Al Jazeera English or even the BBC. Uh, so, you know, <laughs> some people have been critical of the BBC too, but the point is to diversify. I mean, that's, that's, that's the point I'm making here. Yeah, I think, Roger, that gets back to that curiosity. What perspectives am I missing? Or what is the the lens that I'm not seeing? How do I look at this from different angles to see how to respond with, with values I hold dear or we all hold dear that help us evaluate those different sources we're hearing? So that's a great suggestion. 
Avia, I think you had another question. Hi. Um, I know you said to start with compassion um, when talking to people, but just is there anything else on an individual level that we can do to talk to the other side? Um, I do have a couple of Palestinian friends and Israeli friends, so or just anything we can do as we move forward. Sure. Sure. Well, I mean, you've already kind of hinted at it, even with the way you framed the question, which is to build a relationship, to see something about their humanity that is separate, you know, from the fact that they're Jewish or Palestinian. Um, uh, we talk in our book about a concept called for many to one. So if you would imagine the Holocaust, for example, you know, we don't, I, I try not to frame it as 6 million Jews who were killed. I frame it as one Jew killed 6 million times. You know, I don't think of 750 Palestinians um, expelled in 1940. I think of one Palestinian, my friend Raja, expelled 750,000 times. It allows me to enter a compassion space to learn and to listen. Um, I don't, I wouldn't suggest that most of the time we have deep answers for those who are outside of our experience. What we can do is listen. We can ask, do you need anything? Is there anything you want from me? You know, uh, uh, perhaps a Palestinian, you know, just wants to hear that you care about their experience and that you know you don't know it all, but you want to. Uh, similarly for your Jewish friends, they want to know that you care about them. Um, we, we haven't talked a lot about anti-Semitism tonight, but I wanna be very clear that there is a, a rise in anti-Semitism that was happening before October 7th that has increased. And we can't do the work we do if we don't also call out anti-Semitism, and we do routinely. There are even spaces within the pro-Palestinian protest community that have veered into anti-Semitism. And we need to speak on it. At the same time, please, I caution you that many times you are hearing protests labeled as Hamas supporting violence. And that is extremely rare. They are protesting for Palestinian rights. They're not celebrating Hamas's violence, but we keep hearing this. So just, you know, I think it's just really important to understand that what we're hearing is usually slanted and to ask questions and to realize that if something is wrong, it's wrong. If it's anti-Semitism, it's wrong. If it's Islamophobia or anti-Palestinian racism, it's wrong. Speak to it as a moral crime because that's what it is. Thank you. Thanks for your question. Marsha, I think we have time for one last one before we wrap up. So I'll invite you to ask the last question now. I, I, I do a lot of work on Israel-Palestine from the human rights point of view as well. And um, people are always pushing forward, quote unquote, real politique. Um, and I'm just wondering how you, you two guys feel about um, speaking to that because, you know, they basically say to folks who are taking things from the human rights point of view that you're naive or you don't know what you're talking about, et cetera, et cetera. So if you could help, if you could make a comment on that, I would greatly appreciate it. Thank you for all you do. Well, I mean, I, the talking about and our leaders, our political leaders, constantly talk about our values. And they say, you know, our values are support for human rights and freedom and democracy. And um, so reminding people that these are our values, you know, is, is, is not naive. Uh, you know, when, when you react to the Russian 
uh, occupation of Ukraine in a certain way and then react to the Israeli occupation of Palestine in a completely opposite way, you're not living up to your values. You're using your values selectively. Uh, and people can stretch that. I mean, I've, I've President Biden compared Hamas to Russia. I mean, really, I mean, Hamas and militia, about, you know, hate it if you want, but to Russia? And he said, well, they're both trying to destroy a neighboring democracy. Um, I, I don't think that even, you know, deserves a response, a, a, a ridiculous as it is. Over yes, to you. Uh, well, the only thing I'll add is behind some of the questions we got today and to, that we often get, I interpret a commitment to Jewish safety and a fear of the loss of Jewish safety, which I value deeply as a Jewish person and as a human. I tell my colleagues, our Jewish community all the time, the only way to ensure safety for Jews is to make things right with Palestinians. I think it is the most overlooked point because we are constantly put in a contest to choose Jewish life or Palestinian life. Even if you personally don't have a passion for Palestinian rights, that's okay. We need you to recognize and to fight for Palestinian freedom because that is the only way to ensure Jewish safety between the river and the sea. It is the only way. There is no other option. So, you know, we, we shouldn't be swayed by people who make this into a religious struggle between Jews and Muslims or an ethnic one between Jews and Palestinians. This is a political struggle. And uh, I remind uh, people all the time, Palestinians in particular, that the best defenders of Palestinian rights have been Jews. And 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 that's it, you know a testimony and a hope for us going forward that we have all these primarily you know younger Jews who are saying no 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 not in our name um, this is our our hope for the future. Thank you, Jeff and Raja. We are at time, and I'll just end by saying I'm often told that I am naive for thinking that human rights approaches can get us out of this. But my response to that is it's naive to think that what hasn't been working for, as Raju said, almost 100 years is going to get us out of the mess it's gotten us into. And so to land on the words of one of our dear partners, Mitri Rahab, who says, hope is what you do. You both give me so much hope in what you do and in the book you've put out and the resources you've created for communities like ours here tonight. So I want to thank you both really from the depth of my heart for the work you do, the way you show up in the world and your commitment to showing up and, and helping us continue learning with curiosity and humility on our own journeys. I've put some links in the chat. If you haven't read Jeff and Raj's book yet, hopefully the conversation tonight convinced you that this is one you absolutely need to have on your bookshelf to read through once and then engage repeatedly as you keep doing this work for the, the weeks and months and years to come. We also do, as Telos, continue to invite you to call for a ceasefire and the immediate return of all hostages. Our voices matter, especially in the US. We have outsized influence for better or worse, and right now we need to use that. And I also wanna extend an invitation to you, if this is one of the first Telos events you're joining, to join us at the Telos Learning Core. We bring guests like Jeff and Raja into a community space where we continue engaging in these types of conversations, building community across lines of difference, leaning into those types of relationships, listening with humility and curiosity. And we have a community conversation next Tuesday, November 21st, that I invite you to come to, to continue exploring some of the questions that you've asked today. How do we do this work? How do we answer the questions we're getting from our community members? Many ways to keep engaging, but thank you so much, Jeff and Raja, for your time tonight, for the work you do. And thank you to all of you for joining us. We are really grateful for your time and engagement. Thank you so oh, much. Thank you, Sarah. Right. Thanks for having us, Sarah. Take care.